Hello and welcome to this workshop on PGVP MRP. It's all about PGVP release 18 from a RAM perspective and it's tailored to the industry verticals. My name is Stephanie Parker uh, from Trust IT. I am Vice Chair of the 5G Infrastructure Association pre sellerization Working Group. With me is my colleague John. If you'd like to introduce yourself, John. Uh, hello, everybody. I am John Favreau, Stephanie's colleague at Trust IT. I'm also a member of the uh, the 5G uh, PPP Automotive Working Group, and I'll yeah. be helping uh, Stephanie to run the session today. So, just yeah, to uh, mention that this part, this workshop is part of a, an event series organised by the 5G Automotive Association, the 5G Alliance for Connected Industries and Automation the 5GIA and the Public Safety Communications Europe. With us today, we have a fantastic lineup. Can you move to the next slide, please, John? Yes. Um, we have a super panel of industry verticals. So we, ha we have coverage of the automotive, of the manufacturing, of the public safety with um, the Critical Communications Association on board. We have broadcasting and media with 5G MAG. We have satellite with the EMEA Satellite Operators Association. We have the International Rail um, Association, Union, the Maritime Association and uh, utilities covered also. We, then we have the, the, the other association is the 5G Health Association. And then we have some panelists giving us some multi-vertical perspectives and they, this includes the, um, a couple of RAN specialists, but one of our very important guests this afternoon is in fact Wan Shi Chen, who is the new Ch um, RAN TSG chair in 3GBP. So congratulations and a big welcome to you, Wan Shi. We'll be introducing you to all of the panelists very soon. I'd just like to give you a, a quick overview um, of some of our key messages. So if we can move on to the next slide, John for the industry verticals coming into standards. You probably don't know who the clangers are. It was an old TV series done on a very low budget back in the 70s. Um, and they spoke their own little language. They lived on the moon. And so that's just one of the first lessons to learn when you want to get involved in, in 3GPP standardization. You have to learn to speak the, a specific language um, that's related to the work. Um, but this is some of our like sort of main key messages for everyone. Uh, the first one is to join the 3GPP and attend the meetings, get support from 3GPP specialists because they are there. We, we invite all of the, the specialists in 3GPP to em embrace vertical industries, stay the course, form partnerships, and also form those partnerships with market rollouts in mind. The, the 3GPP is a standards organization. It cannot solve every problem, but it, it's there for the standards. Um, and we, as the group of, all, of associations organizing this workshop series, we don't have a magic wand, but we are here to help. So if anyone wants an attendance certificate or you have comments and questions, please, you can drop me a line. These um, slides will be available afterwards. So I, we can now move on then to our little fireside chat with, with our uh, RAN chair, Wan Shi. So if we can move on to the, to the next slide, John. Thanks. So here we are. So welcome. So first of all, we'd like if we'd like to ask you if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and your experiences in 3 gvp I'm sure that many people in the audience today um, have, haven't actually met you because as the new chair. So this is a nice opportunity to make an introduction. The floor is yours, Wan Shi, for the first question. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, thank, uh, th thank you, everyone. Hi, everyone. Really a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's also very good to see a few uh, familiar faces uh, like Matthew, Nicola, and Thierry, and Tero, to name a few. Um, about myself, my name is uh, Wang Shi Chen. I was elected as CP Run Plenary Chair uh, in March. I was appointed in April. Uh, before that, I was the prominent Raman guy, uh, you know, Rama is a group where we were, uh, uh, you know, we, we work as a group, try to uh, 
develop the specification based on the project proved by RAM Plenary is the physical layer. Um, I started joining RAM 1 in March 2008. So now it's over 13 years. Um, along the course, I was uh, elected RAM 1 Vice Chair from uh, August 2013 for four years until August 2017. After that, I was elected RAM 1 Chair for almost four years. I just stepped down in May. I, from work experience perspective, I have more than 20 years of experience. It's funny that my work experience kind of covering an end-to-end system, if you will. I work a start with operator uh, for China Mobile for about one year. I also work for Ericsson for about five and a half years. I've been with Qualcomm since May 2006. Now is about 15 years. Um, I am one hobby I love a lot is running. Uh, one thing I'm so proud to say that uh, my best mar- marathon time was uh, two hours, 54 minutes, something I'm really proud of. Yeah, so that's a, that's a brief uh, introduction of myself. Lovely. Nice to, be, to meet everyone of you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the next question is could you tell us something about 5G advance? What are some other sort of key things that people would need to know about? Yeah, thank you. This is a very good question. So as you all know, right now, we, we already had uh, two releases delivered by 3GP, uh, release 15, release 16 for 5G. Now we're in the, in the, in the course of trying to uh, finish release 17, uh, which is the third release of 5G. Uh, we, last week, we just confirmed that we'll try to deliver release 17 uh, from Realm 1 perspective, physical layer perspective by December this year. And for run two, run three, run four in March next year. And then in June, we're going to have the so-called SN one freeze for the 17. Now we're at uh, more or less a transition time. Uh, all you can say the second phase of 5G uh, is, is really, really uh, uh, great to see that PCG approved the use of 5G advanced in April. And now we also have official logo for this 5G advanced. This, uh, this will start from this 18. Uh, as you, you already know, we're going to have a the workshop next week. So 5G Advanced, in my view, is, is a, a great opportunity for us to continue evolving a lot of features we still see a strong need to evolve. Um, at the same time, it's also a good opportunity for us to not only focus on the projects which are you know, targeting for some immediate deployment needs, but also to take a look at the project, which may have a longer term impact, uh, you know, in terms of to help us to, to aim a little bit higher, a little bit longer, at the same time to lay a good foundation for us to, in the future, to connect with 6G somehow. Uh, as you all know, 6G discussion, after CBB already started, of course, right now it's still at the research stage, but at a certain point, we'll see 6G discussion in, in, in 3PP, maybe, I don't know, five, four or five down the road. And then this 5G advance really, uh, in my view, is more like bridging what we have right now to, to continue to lay good foundation 5G at the same time, also try to see what we can do to continue evolving 5G eventually to move on to 6G. Thanks very much. And then that key questions um, for, for the verticals is, how can we encourage greater participation in RAM particularly? And related to that, what are the keys to success in RAM from an industry vertical perspective? Thank you. Thank you. This is a very good question. Um, as you know, 5G starting from day one uh, is built to have a, a, a framework which can accommodate not only the traditional EMBB services, but also to accommodate uh, the so-called vocal domain services, uh, something like IoT, you know, machine type of communications, uh, V2X, you know, to, men- to name a few. So the, we are really, um, as a group, uh, trying to offer services beyond the traditional services, uh, you know, to, to make sure that we can serve as, as great as possible uh, to, to the expansion of different industries. And this, this, this thing, I think this, this is a high level thing. I think we still continue to see that. Um, if you see how we manage the projects, we already see a, a first good expansion to vertical domain in Risk 16. And this was got uh, uh, further acceler- accelerated in Risk 17. 
Now in re resetting, I do see this is, this trend is going to continue. Um, in terms of uh, participation from vertical domain uh, for, for the bottom play players, I, I think this these things. I think this is what's important is to try to understand the process of GPP. How we you know start with a with a project. You know, typically start with something called study item where we try to figure out uh, the user case requirements, the associated techniques, to see what are the possible you know, design options, the feasibility, all the data analysis, also of course including the performance benefits of all the different things. Now we try to move on the so-called work item to try, to try to see how to specify the techniques that we believe offer the best compromise or best trade-off to make things happen. So my, my first suggestion would be to try to understand, uh, you know, the process. And also, we as a group also encourage uh, the vertical domain players to come to 3PP and, and it's, it's open forum. Uh, I think this very engaged discussion is, is, is very critical for us to understand each other better because, you know, in any case, it, the 3PP resources is, is quite limited. Uh, there's always a good competition about how the resources should be used in terms of, um, you know, to be, to be spent for different projects. But this is through very careful discussion, through input understanding, we can always find uh, the compromise and consensus. And after all, it is constant driven. I think through active dis discussion, this is, this is something I do see this is important for all of us to do, to increase the mutual understanding, to, to really make sure we can participate uh, you know, to, to make sure we can contribute as a group. And the last thing I want to mention is, is that is, is also, you know, try to see uh, how to integrate uh, the vertical projects into the existing project. When I say integrate, it's also uh, what I'm trying to say that uh, in, in many cases, uh, at, this, at this point in time, we try to, um, you know, Whatever managed manage project, we, we, we do have this kind of separate project uh, for vertical domain uh, versus the traditional EMU domain. But the certain point is probably also important to try to see whether we could possibly integrate things into, uh, into the existing project, try to, uh, let's say, maximize the common, common part to try to consolidate into a single project and see, to basically try to maximize com commonality somehow. This need more careful thinking. It's, it's not definitely not straightforward, uh, but there's something also we can work as a group to see how to move forward. Yeah, absolutely agree. In fact, what we're going to be doing this afternoon is in the second session, we're going to be looking at the, um, at the common requirements across the verticals, and then we're going into a discussion where participants will also be able to share their views as well, either by polling or by uh, raising their hands. This first session is uh, mostly focused on what industry verticals that have already um, contributed to RAN. So let me just take you back a slide. Oh, sorry, John, you need to take us back a slide. <laughs> Thanks. So the, yeah, there we go. So I'll open the floor now to all of our panelists this afternoon to give a brief introduction of themselves. You, you can see them also on your screen. Um, so over to you, just go in the order perhaps of the, of the names that you see. I apologize, this is the wrong version. It is Terra Persona, not that we, there's no R in there. I put on the wrong version, I do apologize. But, uh, the floor is yours, Maxime, if you'd like to start. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Maxime <gasps> from Maxime, uh, the, just, yeah. the Sorry, go on. CTO, thank you. So. Maxime has been one of the key people behind the organization of these events, so thank you to you as well. Okay, we'll, we'll move on to Michael, and then the order that you see on the screen, thanks. Yes, hello, good afternoon, and good morning, and good evening. Uh, my name is Michael Barr, I'm with Siemens Technology in Munich, and I'm the Working Group 1 Vice Chair, uh, Working Group 1 Chair in 5GS here. Working Group 1 is on use cases and requirements. I'm also a rapporteur or was the rapporteur of really 17 work items related to industrial verticals. So the CAF and ECAF work items leading to TS22104 and uh, additions to TS22261. Hello, my name is Tero Personen. I'm um, 
from Erlis Verkat, which is the Finnish public safety network operator, presenting TCCA, the uh, market representation partner for, for critical comms, communication, and pricing, public safety, uh, police, fire, ambulance, as well as transport, mining, and other, other mission critical type of uh, sectors. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm David Vargas. I work at the BBC and I'm representing the 5G Mac. And I'm currently the content distribution technology chair. Uh, and in 3GPP, I'm one of the feature leads on NR MBS. Thank you. Nicole Schubert, I'm working for Talent Selling Space and uh, Rapporteur for the uh, release 17 uh, new radio supporting uh, non traditional network. Uh, and uh, I'm not representing EZOA, but I've coordinated with EZOA. So maybe my views, may, some of my views may not represent the views of all the EZOA participants. Thank you. So my name is Inga Wendler, and uh, I'm working for Swiss Federal Railways and seconded to EIC, the International Union of the Railways, and addressing uh, railway needs in the context of future mobile communication system since 2016. So I'm in several uh, downstream groups, and um, yeah, I have some experience now how 3GPP works, and um, also make this clear. Potentially, railways are the oldest uh, vertical in this market because we are using uh, GSM uh, for, for already operation purposes up to now. Thank you. Hi, I'm Hyuni Gu. I'm a CEO from Think Techno. I am also a 3 p liaison person for Ayala to deliver more time uh, input to 3 p Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone from, uh, from Manchester. I'm Julian Stafford from the European Utilities Telecoms Council. So, um, yes, I'm the technical director within EUTC. Um, fascinating range of activities over the past couple of years since we started to get involved with these programmes and really great to be part of this, uh, this community and interested to see what everyone has to, to say and share this afternoon. And I, and I think uh, Eric may have just joined us. Uh, Eric, are you, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello. Hi, Eric. Hello. <laughs> just, that's what you call just-in-time management. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I've been working with the EUTC in, in SA1 in 3GP. Uh, I work for Samsung, and uh, we're happy to be involved in vertical engagements. Andrea? Yeah. Mm, Hi. Good, uh, good, good, afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andrea Di Giglio. Uh, I work for uh, Team Telecom Italia uh, in Italy, and uh, I'm the coordinator of 5G Solutions Project. It is a project from ICT19 uh, funded by the European Commission. Uh, the project is the flagship project uh, for verticals uh, um, in uh, 5G technologies in Europe. Hello, uh, my name is Matthew Webb. I'm from Huawei and I work in 3GPP RAN, in particular uh, RAN 1, uh, similar domain there to one sheet. Uh, I was the rapporteur of Naraband IoT uh, work item in RAN from its beginning in release 13 through until release 15, uh, and then I switched over to be a co-rapporteur of the NRV2X work item, um, and I, I continue to work in, in the general area of Sidelink, as well as having some um, responsibilities uh, for REDCap these days. Yeah, thank you very much, yeah, Matthew, as well, and bringing your RAN expertise. It's very much appreciated. Uh, we'll now move on to Christoph. Yes, hi there. Hello. Uh, I'm Christoph Tümler, and uh, I'm working for Helios uh, in Germany. Um, Helios is the largest um, private healthcare provider in Europe, and I'm also a member of the 5G Health Association, and also active in the 6G Health Institute. Yeah, and last but not least, Thierry, another RAN specialist. Thank you. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Thierry Birizo. I'm the director of IoT Telecom uh, from, uh, and Standard from Novamint. Novamint represents interest of verticals in uh, 3GPP. We are particularly involved in SA1, RAN1, RAN2, and uh, more important for today, in RAN in general. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, John is now going to launch our first 
poll, so I'll pass the floor to you, John. So poll number one, this is, of course, all about uh, uh, the topic today. How important do you think? But by all means, be, be perfectly honest, by the way. If you don't think uh, uh, it is important to cover requirements, that's also something we need to know. Two thirds believe it is essential and one third approximately believes it's um, uh, quite important. There is, there is some voice about it not being important and that's important for us to hear also. So we'll now move on to um, the first presentation on the inputs to uh, RAN and we're starting with Nicholas Chubert. So you can stop sharing these slides, John, and we can move on to the slides from Nicholas, and then Nicholas can take the floor. Thank you, uh, Stefan. So we have, um, hello everybody. Um, I, I wanted to provide uh, some contextual information, and then I'm going to present the uh, enhancements that are being proposed for the release 18. So before that, I would like, uh, if you can move to slide number three directly, if people are interested, they oh, can always three. look at, uh, at the previous slides. But, but let's move to, that's where we are in release 17. Uh, there are uh, three main uh, normative track. One is in SA for the system architecture to support satellite access and backhaul. And the normative phase to be completed in September 2021. At RAM, there are one normative track on the enhancement to the new radio protocol to support non-terrestrial network. And it should be completed in March 2022 including the S-band, and we expect a study, uh, well, it's planned, because that was the last week decision to start a study about above 10 gigahertz bands in April 2022. Um, and then there was this, uh, the approval of a new work item uh, following the completion of a study phase on the enhancements to the Narban IoT and EMTC radio protocol to support non-terrestrial network. And that should be completed in March 2022. So this is what is in release 17 with respect to satellite. Um, maybe you can move to the next uh, slide. Uh, this is just to what is direct connectivity, means direct connectivity between an end user device, whether it's handheld or IoT device, to a satellite. Whereas indirect connectivity, there is going to be an intermediate node in between the end user devices and the satellite. Typically, direct connectivity scenarios are going to operate in lower than six gigahertz band, whereas the uh, indirect connectivity uh, would probably operate in above 10 gigahertz uh, bands. Next slide, please. Uh, the, these are the characteristics of typical direct connectivity and indirect connectivity uh, satellite uh, networks. And uh, so, um, and the next slide also shows um, the different design challenges, challenges. I would just say for IoT, uh, we're talking about very low cost devices with omnidirectional antenna, and to have low cost satellite uh, infrastructure. We're talking about service rate, uh, maximum hundreds of kilobits per second. Whereas uh, for the other one, we are looking for higher uh, data rate, potentially, uh, either for direct connectivity, serving directly smartphone, or indirect connectivity, uh, serving uh, VSAT, we can go to hundreds of, hundred of megabits per second. The next slide is just example of uh, demonstration that are uh, illustrate uh, ongoing development based on the standards. And I would love to go to the next slide, number eight, where uh, this is the vision that we have and that we are uh, trying to implement in 3GBP. So in the 4G context, it was uh, interoperability between satellite networks and terrestrial network, where both 
systems were independently designed from one another, but then connected. And in 5G, we have we are achieving the integration where basically we are enhancing uh, terrestrial protocols so that it can support satellite network. And we are looking for the 6G context where uh, the uh, goal would be to optimize um, or to design uh, a technology framework that would be optimized for both terrestrial and satellite components. The next slide uh, illustrates the roadmap that we are uh, uh, implementing in 3GPP uh, run. So as part of the release 17, we are defining market enabling features and release 18 and 19 will be enhancement to optimize performance and, new and provide new capabilities before uh, coming to 6G. Now let's go to number 10, the slide number 10, the features that we Talis have proposed. So we would like to put emphasis on two aspects as part of this release. First, to improve the performance uh, the user experience and uh, the network capacity. So we are proposing uh, an availability as well. So these are the features that we propose, asynchronous multi-connectivity and carrier aggregation, further coverage enhancements to support mass market smartphone or to increase the availability for these kind of devices. And also possibly to enhance the UE characteristics, uh, especially for vertical uh, requirements uh, like public, sa public safety. In terms of uh, new capabilities, we are pushing for uh, a feature which we believe is very important in order to meet uh, requirements uh, associated to uh, regulated services like emergency calls uh, that are calling for reliable and accurate uh, location. We may consider support of UE without GNSS. Um, and there is another feature uh, which is uh, candidate uh, support of discontinuous coverage so that we can exploit a constellation as it becomes uh, deployed. Um, so these are other features that not necessarily NTN specific, but there could be interest to use and adopt them in the context of NTN. So these are red cap, uh, new radio protocol simplification uh, for voice over NR, um, um, complementary TDD or uh, half duplex FDD, IAB and uh, MBS as well. Uh, next slide, I will show you what are all the features that have been uh, proposed by all the companies for this release 18 workshop and you see it's quite many <laughs> and uh, the challenge will be to sort out which of this list uh, which of, uh, of this feature list will go through in the release 18 and what the uh, and maybe the other will go to the uh, subsequent releases and that's going to be the main discussion uh, up to December. Um, next slide is about the IoT NTN what's going to be next. At the time we have prepared the slides we didn't know what would be adopted as part of the release 17. Now we have a clear view but definitely what we all know is that there, there should be some enhancement as part of the release 18 framework to improve the energy uh, consumption of UE devices. Um, and some other features that are considered for NTN could be considered for IoT, but that's going to be discussed. So this is in a nutshell what we have on, on the table. And I would summarize in the next slide the what we as Thales we recommend is to optimize the performance. I mean, take advantage of release 18 to optimize the performance 
in terms of throughput uh, per UE, network capacity, UE power saving, availability of, of, uh, of service, and address in priority new capabilities to meet the requirements associated to regulated services like uh, an emergency call that calls for very high accurate uh, location uh, and a few other feature if there is one. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much Nicholas and, co and congratulations to yourself and your colleagues for all the work that you've been doing. Um, for the audience's benefit, and what, next up will be Andrea from presenting 5G solutions. Um, so while John's putting up, we'll, do, we'll take the questions at the end, Nicholas, from the audience. Um, while John is putting up the presentation from Andrea, I'd just like to inform yourself and of the other panelists and the participants that the personalization working group it does have a roadmap in production hopefully it will be completed this summer um but i really like your roadmap and you know that's something that could be a good contribution but if anyone who's interested in the roadmap um then you know please get in touch with us and we'll see how we can um interface on that so next we will we'll welcoming andrea from 5g solutions i'm here there we are there we are thank you <laughs> okay thank you uh, uh, thank you for the introduction, Stephanie. Um, yeah, thank you, Andrea. Um, the, yes. uh, as I said before, uh, this uh, I'm from uh, from Tim, the, the incumbent operator in network operator in Italy. But now I'm representing also uh, the 5G Solutions project. That is a project that, including uh, several verticals, in particular the Industry 4.0, uh, the Smart Energy. Uh, the entertainment and media, smart city and smart port, and then there is uh, a important uh, multi-living lab that uh, uh, have a concurrent uh, um, uh, living lab uh, in the same infrastructure. Uh, this is an important disclaimer that 5G solutions uh, use uh, um, the project that uh, including several use cases as I said from verticals but the infrastructure are completely provided by other projects that are 5G and 5G and the run impacts are derived by the implementing use cases. So uh, this work in, in other words uh, this work is uh, we are uh, experimenting these innovative use cases uh, the fact is that uh, uh, some KPIs are necessary uh, for these and as a consequence, uh, uh, this may push uh, the um, release of the uh, uh, In particular, saying that the main input to um, radio access network is that uh, we defined as the life cycle uh, in the living lab between five and 10 years. Under this rationale, uh, the design of uh, the, uh, the, the terminals, the, the user elements should be uh, future-proof in order to ensure the capability to operate in the radio network uh, of the new releases. Uh, on the same uh, on the same um, line, uh, the design uh, of the terminal should be future uh, proof also to ensure the capability of operation and connect. Uh, then the uh, the throughput that uh, is not enough. Uh, in particular, we consider the, the upload uh, that uh, is unbalanced. Uh, so uh, we need a symmetric uh, situation and the throughput for unload uh, is necessary uh, to uh, be increased. Uh, then there is a big problem that is being discussed inside the project. Uh, we had also a workshop where uh, this problem is uh, yet, uh, deeply discussed. If uh, uh, our um, needs 
for the network are deterministic or non-deterministic. Um, at the end, as always happens, uh, there is a mix of two. Uh, so uh, we need to optimize the performance of the deterministic device, uh, taking uh, into consideration that the device are not moving. So uh, the traffic partner is known in advance in the deterministic network, and a device can support application require. Uh, of course, the deterministic, but also the non-deterministic communications. Uh, the network function uh, should be exposed via open interfaces, so API. And the very, very important is the orchestration of radio resources that should be supported in a multi-tenant. Uh, thank you for uh, the uh, questions that you did uh, before, but very similar to the um, Support the patterns is, is uh, uh, just in theory supported by uh, but uh, we should specify a, a real announcement as well as the uh, upload performance requirement are uh, currently supported by 3GPP. Uh, but uh, we should improve. So we'll move on now to yeah, David. So the floor is yours, David. Thank you very much for being here and for sharing your uh, inputs. Hello, everyone. Hope you can hear me okay. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So, well, this, these slides are very similar to what uh, 5G Mac has submitted to the 3GPP run uh, release 18 workshop. Just a very quick uh, overview of the scope of the activities and uh, in 5G Mac work is being done on content production, content distribution and media consumption. Today we are going to, we are going to talk about content production and content distribution. Uh, next slide please. So regarding media distribution, the motivation, so media, different types of content, TV, radio, on demand, personalized, now is reaching audiences by different networks and technologies, uh, mobile broadband networks, terrestrial broadcasts and satellites. And these type of networks are in, in the scope of both 5G Mac and 3GPP. So 5G Mac supports uh, work on these, on these areas. So next slide, please. So in uh, there are two tracks uh, that have been discussed. So the first track of, of, of work is uh, LT-based 5G terrestrial broadcast. So this topic of terrestrial broadcast in 3GPP addresses dedicated broadcast infrastructure, for instance, high power, high tower networks. And one of the characteristics is that it's downlink only traffic. There is no unicast. And one of the main use cases considered for this type of, of networks and deployments uh, are delivery of line linear content to mobile devices. This can be smartphones, tablets, and in vehicles as well, very important, out of the home and on the move. So the delivery of this type of uh, dedicated terrestrial broadcast that works in 3GPP is addressed by LT-based 5G terrestrial broadcast. And there are some reference here for, for, so, to some relevant uh, work items and this, uh, it also meets the requirements as set out by 3GPP in these references from a radio perspective. So next slide, please. So 5G Mac proposes enhancements on these topics. So uh, for instance, and you have here the priorities in red. So first connecting the NTB run to the 5G core. Uh, there is also a priority on optimization on simultaneous support of 5G broadcast and NR unicast, and then to improve the spectral efficiency uh, to the introduction of time interleaving to exploit uh, time diversity. There are other topics of interest, for instance, uh, to introduce capability for public warning and other enhancements uh, that can include MIMO or overhead reduction. So then there is a, another track of, of work and is media distribution over public land mobile networks. 
And in this space, so 3GPP is developing multiple specifications that have an impact on, on media distribution over mobile networks for RAN, uh, NR multicast and broadcast services. Uh, this work item actually has an impact in different, in dif for different verticals. Uh, for, for me, they can improve the delivery of common content, the delivery of multicast broadcast services versus unicast. The characteristics for this is, is integrated to, with the unicast network and reduces the, the, the cellular infrastructure. Also, the main use case consider why uh, for this work item and uh, for media distribution is as well delivery of linear life, this common content uh, to mobile devices out of the home and on the move. So regarding priorities for release 3GPP run release 18, uh, priorities identify is to enable receive only mode, to, uh, to enable free to air uh, transmissions for MBS. Also, uh, multicast reception in RRC idle state. And then also, depending on what is approved uh, on, on, on release 17, if there are leftovers, to, those could be considered as well for release 18. There are other topics of interest. There has been a lot of discussion on these concerns of UE handset, uh, handset backwards compatibility or significant impacts on handsets that may hinder the implementation of the feature. So UE complexity is, uh, is always is, is a key is a, a key aspect to, to consider. So other enhancements are so other topics are support of SFN, uh, MBS resource optimization for run sharing deployment. This means different core, cores from different MNOs that could share the same run for the to deliver the common content. And then the, there are also a set of features to improve the performance of the system, such as physical layer time interleaving, non-orthogonal approaches, such as broadcast, multicast, and unica superposition transmission, BMAST. And then there are two aspects to study. There are uh, proposed uh, techniques to enhan enhance the coverage. But here, the interest is, part uh, is rural areas, is to provide media content to rural areas. Uh, and also, there is a discussion to study how to provide universal access to unicast, multicast, and broadcast services. So, next slide. So, this is the next slide, the, the last slide. So, this is regarding media production. So, 5G Max also supports applic enhancements, and this can be for more bit rates or better quality of service. But uh, also, it's important uh, to conduct a gap analysis within release 17 because uh, taking into account the requirements that were provided in audiovisual production work item in SA1 and taking into account on ongoing, ongoing work in, in SA4. So that's, that's all from me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, David. And also thank you to Jordi, who's the technical director of 5G Mag, also for his support and inputs also in, in earlier um, webinars that we've been doing. Uh, we'll now pass the floor to Hannigan, so she'll give us some insights from a maritime perspective. So thank you in advance, John will now, uh, yeah, they're right there already, so thank you very much for being here. So the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, and hi, everybody. Uh, this slide uh, described uh, what were uh, already uh, provided uh, to run as an input. So uh, uh, I usually uh, provide the input uh, with a collaboration with the public safety domain because maritime domain uh, have a very uh, common requirement uh, with the public safety in terms of a RAN perspective. So, so far, I usually make a voice uh, by the contribution developed by cooperation with the public safety delegate. So, uh, NR site refinancement is all very important to uh, extend the coverage and also provide the direct communication between uh, ships without uh, uh, network infrastructure in the ocean. And 
and our multicast and broadcast are also very key uh, feature to be required for maritime domain because the broadcast uh, technologies are very common uh, what common uh, technology to be used in the uh, SC and also uh, non-terrestrial network satellite is a very uh, essential and fundamental uh, feature to be required for uh, maritime requirement. And three uh, items uh, have been partially taken off, though it need additional enhancement because it is not yet to take into account the communication environment specific to maritime domain where the radio channel characteristics at sea are not the same as the ones on land. The satellite positioning is uh, important to support between vessels uh, in order to get the more exact positioning information when any vessel accident happened at sea. And the three features above need to be provided in randomly varying communication environment as see it. So those uh, features, I hope those features continue to be uh, enhanced in run uh, work uh, with 18 words. Thank you. Um, just a reminder to our panelists that you can, if you've got any questions, to please post them in the dedicated Q&A panel rather than in the chat. Um, it's because it's easy for us to, to look at them afterwards also. Uh, we'll now pass the floor to um, Ingo. So Ingo will give us some of the railway perspectives. Thanks, John. That was great. That was super. That was really quick. So the floor is yours, Ingo. Thank you, Stephanie. So uh, I want to address our, our needs in the context of uh, so-called narrow bands, uh, channel boundaries so that has been identified for, I would say, a time frame of 10 years where both systems coexist. Next slide, please. So when I'm talking, when I'm talking about the coexistence that we have to operate both systems, the current GSMR and, and the future FMCS yes, for a time frame of 10, 10 years because uh, to, to change the rolling stock in one night is, uh, seems to be impossible because you have to change uh, thousands of um, locomotives and uh, train compositions uh, in one night. It is uh, nearly impossible. So that means that we, we have a, got a, a spectrum range uh, from SAP to about 2.5.6 megahertz. So we have to share this uh, spectrum portion by the two systems and um, we have also received the 1900 megahertz uh, for so-called hotspots like railway stations or shunting yards and please keep in mind um, we are using this only for operational purposes and uh, our coverage and our deployments are very very deterministic in in, in that way because uh, we cannot allow any um, potential issues here, interruptions, because we are, we are playing with the safety of the trains and, to, and the passengers. So we, what we see in, in this context is that we want to share this uh, 900 megahertz among the FRMSS and the GSMR, and we are looking for a solution that um, allows to go lower channel band within five megahertz. And in this context, next slide, please. So we want to address this in, in the uh, release 18 uh, timeframe. So we will limit this uh, to FDD and, um, and be asking for a potential, re re but we cannot ask for a redesign of the NR. We just want to have, uh, uh, we, are looking, we are looking for a solution that is uh, just uh, based on 5G and R and uh, gives us the possibility to narrow down uh, the channel bandwidth. Next slide, please. So in this context where we had uh, some uh, workshops with other um, potential users of uh, also with having the same requirement of less than five megahertz. So with our partners, uh, Anterix, Qualcomm, Nokia, and we discussed this uh, before this workshop and uh, we identified similarities in this context and uh, our view is uh, to make this available also for, for broader uh, user community um, because uh, our pain here in this context is a spectrum regulation and spectrum allocation where we have, where we have to find solutions and um, 
please be also aware we need to utilize our spectrum potentially more efficient than in other domains uh, because um, we have a lot of applications that are safety related and safety related means uh, safety integrity uh, levels are up to four. Thank you. Super, thank you very much Ingo. Um, we'll move on. We're going to have the discussions as I was saying later on in the, uh, this evening or morning or night or wherever you may be in the world. So we'll now move on then to Julian and Eric for their presentations. So thank you, thank you, Ingo, thank you, Julian and Eric. Okay, thanks, thanks, Stephanie, and thank thanks, you. thanks all. And the uh, yeah, the, the mention there of the broadcast stuff before reminded me that there are several quite interesting uh, football matches taking place at the moment, which others may be interested to, to monitor. So uh, really good to see a few familiar faces on this call. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, please, uh, John, and I'll give a quick overview of who EUTC are and what we've been doing over the past couple of years and where, and where we're at. So EUTC, uh, our members are essentially household names from the gas and electricity energy sector and water sector throughout, throughout, throughout Europe. You will see them listed around the edges of the, uh, of the, the slide there. We've got many, again, very large entities involved, with the likes of GE and ITRON, Nokia and so on, who work alongside us in standardization. Um, next slide, please, uh, please, John. So to, to cut this into 30 seconds, we represent the interest of the utilities across the whole telecommunications uh, solution um, portfolio. So everything from satellite to fiber to microwave, and of course, into the technologies that we're discussing here, 2G, 3G, 4G, and moving along into 5G as well. And that's a combination of self-provide systems, bought-in systems from third parties, and of course, uh, solutions which combine a hybrid of those two. And you'll see we're very, very familiar with working with large organizations such as CEPT, Etsy, and ITU on large long-term projects which require standardization, international harmonization of frequencies and of course standardization of technical solutions as well and we're actually part of a wider group uh, who work globally across Asia, North America, South America, Africa and so on. Okay so really coming into the, the, the content of what we've been doing for the past few years, cellular networks and smart grids, there's a, a huge explosion in the requirements of the utility sector as we move towards smart grids, which itself is being driven by global targets on CO2 reduction. So these come directly, directly from the United Nations uh, and things like COP26 and the Kyoto and Paris agreements and so on. So we need, uh, as a rough estimate, between 100 and 1,000 times the, con the connectivity that we've previously had. And the most cost-effective way to achieve this connectivity, of course, is through wireless means. But as indicated in the slide here, which uh, I actually borrowed from, from Martin Ibadrola, so thanks to her for putting the slide together, you can see the gap that we've got in the center. Yes, public cellular networks give us relatively low cost uh, connectivity, but what we actually require is something which we only currently obtain from our own private networks, especially in terms of Black Start's uh, resilience, cybersecurity, very high availability and low latency. Uh, connectivity and of course all of those things sound very familiar uh, to anybody who may be connected with developing solutions for the automotive sector the manufacturing sector or the blue light sector so as a utility community we are keen to use uh, more of the solutions which are potentially available through 5g and LTE releases 18 and 19 and onwards but it's going to require a lot of work to take us from where we are at the moment which is largely best effort solutions into the things that we need for mission critical infrastructure. Uh, and of course, the one unique and, uh, and quite problematic uh, area for utilities, the energy utilities, is when the power's down, these networks are also down. So how would we restart the grid if we're entirely reliant on these types of solutions? Um, next slide, please, John. Okay, so, EUTC are relatively new to 3GPP uh, and it's at least partially uh, thanks to the group here with 5G ACIA and so on 
uh, and the events organized back in February uh, 2019 and onwards into Rome and elsewhere, which EUTC became engaged in this. Of course, the headache that EUTC has got is telecommunication standards are not our core business. So we don't always have the resources to drive everything that we would like to. But we've been very fortunate to have support from some major players when we look at our work and study items in SA1. So, of course, Samsung, Vodafone, Novament and others you can see on there. We're also involved in, in RAN and very interested in what might happen uh, with the possibility of higher power uh, edge devices in certain scenarios and actually success already taken place. The creation of band 87 and 88 was at least partially a result of demands by the utility sector, most notably in Ireland, where the existing frequency bands couldn't be used. So creation of new bands in the RAN layer was uh, phenomenally useful to us. And we've also spent quite a lot of time, as I mentioned before, talking and examining some of the uh, developments by the other sectors. So as we've already heard from, the rail and manufacturing sectors, TCCA and others, who have already put a lot of effort into 3GPP and developing solutions which potentially could be adopted uh, for alternative but parallel uses by the utility sector. So we may not always need to start from scratch, which would be a big help for, uh, for the utility teams. It's the base sector as well. We just heard from the satellite connectivity uh, gentleman there about what the options could be and this in terms of very deep connectivity in in extremely rural parts of north america south america uh, europe and so on could be very useful where just the deployment of terrestrial networks could never be cost effective for us we'll just try and wrap up this section here i know i think eric's got quite a bit to say as well and some more more details as well which might might fit into this section or section two but we think positives for industry players and the equipment vendors and the other members of 3GPP is that currently the utility sector is largely an untapped market and potentially represents billions of devices in the future. Um, the changes that are driving this additional market are being, are being driven by global standards, as we mentioned on climate change pri primarily. If we don't get this right, we essentially end up either with a lot more expensive electricity or a less, a less reliable electricity supply. So in, in, in contrast to some of the other sectors, which may or may not happen or may happen more slowly than we would anticipate, the utility sector has to bring about these changes. There are of course other solutions that we could adopt, but it would be fascinating if we can get what the usage that we require out of the 3GPP community. And I think finally there as well, we also see that Utilities themselves have a phenomenal part to play in facilitation of 5G and 6G networks, simply because of the amount of assets and infrastructure that we have, both in the ground with electricity, fiber, ducts, and overhead uh, with electricity poles, pylons, and all, the, and all the rest. Okay, so that's just a really quick run through. We've only been involved in this now for just over 12 months. Uh, I must say thank you to the guys in, uh, in Nokia, in Ericsson, in Iberdrola and EDF, and in Samsung for getting us this far. Um, it's been something of a baptism by fire, but we know we've got a lot of work ahead. And uh, thanks to the team that have organized this event today, because by sharing this expertise and our pain points, we will we will drive things, things forward. So Eric, I'll hand over to you if that's okay. Yeah. Thanks. Super, thank you, Julian. Yeah, just before Eric starts, I think this is a really good example of determination and staying power and getting that support on board and I think we're all very appreciative of that so the floor is now yours Eric thank you very much thank you so th this is really a brief introduction to what actually has been achieved in the uh, study in, in SA1 I'll point out that this is um very preliminary in the entire 3GBP standards process. So we identify what it is that we, uh, what other groups can take up, but it's really up to the other groups to take it up. So these are, these, these are sort of potentials. Let's move on to the next slide, please. So the status is that we're, we're uh, nearly done with the study and the normative work will follow. Uh, the information that I show you then is preliminary and hasn't been adopted in the normative standard yet, but it will very likely uh, appear in pretty much the same form as I show it. Um, in 
uh, the what I'll show is one slide that pertains mainly to RAM related impacts or or prospects, and the other uh, in SA. Uh, the EUTC has contributed actively, and uh, I've been working with them the whole way through. Let's proceed, please. So these are representative requirements on the RAN side. Now, uh, to my knowledge, there aren't any proposals to the RAN workshop to cover this. There are many, many of these requirements are very similar to those that are in the cyber physical sort of industrial automation area. So the gaps that will appear are, are small and, and specific. And so I expect that, that this will be taken up really in other areas. So this is a, an opportunity for common interest amongst the utility sector and those that are working in these areas. So uh, advanced metering, what's interesting is that the density of these meters will be quite high. For uh, distribution, feeder automation, and uh, differential protection, we're looking at uh, basically extreme availability use cases that are um, over a wide area. For DR and microgrids and uninterruptible MTC, we're, we're looking at, at a decentralized operation that has to be extremely available. For surveillance video, this is a particular use case that according to their calculations uh, resulted in something like over five gigabits a second uplink. I won't comment on that. Um, then first, there are certain synchronization requirements that will be quite severe. There are other timing areas uh, of study, uh, other requirements that are coming out of SA1 uh, that this will fit in with quite nicely. And so I, I don't, I would say this is all just indicative. There are more requirements in this. I chose those which were kind of extreme and um, I leave it to, uh, to you to, to investigate this further. Let's move on to the next slide, please. So this is the area in which the EUTC contributed, not so much on these radio requirements, which were largely for decentralization and specific uh, high density tasks. Instead, the EUTC focused on, on this manageability area where there was this gap for integration between the, the utility sector networking and the telecommunications networks. So this is the area that, that is interesting that will probably proceed. And while this call is mainly about RAN, I just wanna mention these for your interest. Um, so there's requirements to support enhanced management of cellular networks. What that means is effectively to report changes in configuration and changes in operation um, from the mobile network to the, the um, utility operators. This would allow them to develop a clear and coherent model, both of the performance and also the configuration so that they can identify problems before they occur by uh, essentially modeling the behavior of the system, looking for anomalies and failing over. Th these systems are so high availability that just using one form of access for many of these applications for supporting entire uh, subsystems or substations that, that provide electricity to uh, say a city or population center industrial area isn't sufficient. But failing over takes time. So in order to achieve high availability, they need to know enough, for example, changes in radio performance or network performance that would indicate that there's a high probability of a coming problem or incident. There are also standards that we're looking at for greater security, especially for legacy systems that don't have end-to-end -end security to provide uh, an, an additional hop. The, the part of the, of the 3GB system that is secured is everything from the terminal into the 3GB network. This extends the security over the network to the third-party network or server. Finally, we, this, there's a really interesting set of problems for um, this, this rebooting case where the network um, where the energy network is going down and yet you need the telecommunication network to come back up. So by communicating the timing um, and location of the problem as well as the uninterruptible power supply uh, capability of the uh, telecom provider, the two can work together in order to achieve a more efficient um, and reliable reboot of the energy system. 
So that's another set of requirements and that would be taken up uh, in other 3GP groups. That's all the material I have. If you have any questions, let me, uh, let me look at the chat. I... Yeah, Eric, thanks very much. I thought there were some interesting comments from Emil in the audience. So maybe you could have a quick look at those. Thanks very much for those. Thank you. Um, yeah, and, you know, decide whether you want to do it verbally or uh, in, in a short while, or you can type in the, the response. Um, I just wanted to anticipate a few things that are becoming important in the near future in relation to what also Julian was saying. And we were, um, it was suggested this afternoon that from the policy perspective that we look into energy efficiency and sustainability, not necessarily in general, not necessarily only from a climate perspective. So that's just kind of to keep you all in the loop there. Okay, so thanks very much. And, and again, for this really, I think this is a really good example for any verticals that are hesitating about the GP and about standards at work in general. This is a good example. Um, well, now we'll pass on to Matthew. Matthew Webb, the floor is yours. Thanks, John, again, being super quick. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. We really appreciate this run input, so thanks very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Stephanie. So um, what I have is a, a few slides which summarise what we have in release 17 for RAN and uh, some parts of uh, what is in release 18 um, in SA1, because SA1 tends to uh, feed into RAN later. Uh, so if you go to the, uh, the next slide, uh, RAN verticals up to release 17, um, as one she sort of indicated at the start, release 15 uh, in RAN for NR was primarily, uh, not exclusively, but primarily EMBB. And then in release 16 and 17, uh, we have uh, added uh, quite a lot of vertical structures, um, which many of you will be familiar with, but I thought I'd, I'd give a general overview. Uh, so we have uh, URLLC and IIoT, um, industrial um, IoT, particularly indoors, with millisecond air interface delays and uh, ultra high reliability, um, as well as support of uh, time sensitive networks. Uh, we have um, since release 16, uh, we have um, NR V2X, there was previously LTE V2X, of course, in release 14 and 15. Uh, but we have, uh, we have it now in the NR RAT uh, V2X and Sidelink in general in, in release 17, um, uh, expanding more generally. Uh, this, um, at least in principle, uh, supports uh, latencies down to three milliseconds, reliabilities up to 10 to the minus five, um, and uh, given the bandwidth available about in, in principle 400 megabits um, of data rate. Um, and this is expanding in release 17 to uh, support uh, V2P um, uh, as well as uh, V2V. Um, I'll miss out positioning for a second. Uh, we have red cap, uh, which are reduced K capability UEs, which are intended um, for a broader range of applications than the LTE version of IoT. Uh, although REDCap focused on cost savings, um, which look like they will be in, in the region of 65%, uh, they will achieve data rates um, similar to economical video of two megabits or wireless sensor networks uh, of similar, uh, and maybe wearables uh, of uh, more challenging data rates as well. Um, and uh, this will be a, a distinct type of, of UE or a distinct uh, sort of uh, a version of a UE uh, compared to the, the other UEs in the 3GPP system. Uh, then we have, as we heard uh, from uh, Nicola, we have NTN, non-terrestrial networks, uh, both in the general case um, and also uh, for support of IoT using the LTE IoT um, technologies, EMTC and narrowband IoT. Uh, this has um, been an interesting um, departure for uh, RAN to work in. Uh, we've had to consider propagation delays um, and uh, Dopplers much larger than we normally do to support LEO and GEO orbits uh, to bring this kind of vertical uh, into 3GPP for the first time um, in release 17. Uh, and then, uh, as David was mentioning earlier, there's uh, been working LTE as well, but I'm, I'm speaking here mainly about NR. Uh, in terms of multicast broadcast, um, which you you could view uh, the release 17 work as somehow a, a generalized service in terms of what it introduces to the RAN. So we have a group scheduling of a control channel, for example. Um, but the way it is designed is, is with things like public safety, mission critical, um, IPTV and firmware updates in mind. 
So this this uh, really looks towards the the kind of uh, vertical integration um, that David was talking about. Um, and then we have um, in the middle at the top positioning. Uh, now positioning um, is not in its own right perhaps a vertically integrated industry, um, but as we've been hearing, um, actually uh, positioning is of very wide interest to many uh, vertical business cases, uh, and, and it's often how the requirements in RAN are set is, is with reference to what is required. Um, in a URLC case or, or in a, a, a metering case or, or some sort of accuracy requirement is derived there. So we've had um, accuracy for general devices of around 10 meters and indoors for IoT of down to tens of centimeters. So all of this has been plugged into the RAN um, in release 16 and release 17. Of course, this workshop um, in RAN is about release 18, which hasn't started yet in RAN. So if you go to the next slide, please, um, as Eric um, indicated, we have SA1 in 3GPP, which sets requirements. So in some sense, SA1 is a, a glimpse into the future uh, of RAN. Um, not everything from SA1 comes to RAN, uh, but many things do. Um, and uh, there are many study items in SA1. You can argue a bit over which are vertical and which are not, uh, but I tried to pick the ones that seemed uh, most vertical here. So we have more work uh, related, uh, st more study in fact in, in SA1 related to satellites um, in terms of extraterritorial satellite regulation. Uh, for example, when a, a device is receiving uh, satellite coverage from uh, more than one country's coverage and, and what should be done in that case or when you are in public waters and how the 5G system uh, has to handle those cases. And we have the 5G SCI, which uh, Eric has introduced to us um, just now, so I, I will uh, not mention this too much, um, but this is, is plugging in uh, what adaptations there need to be um, in the 5G system, including in RAN uh, for smart energy and infrastructure. We have quite a number uh, in SA1 of study items related to railway. We have smart railway stations um, so that when there's a fire, the uh, 5G system can be used uh, to stop trains, illuminate fire exits and close doors uh, and so on. We have off-net rail, which is uh, uh, effectively direct communication between railway nodes, either between trains or between some rail side infrastructure in a train. And we have um, FRMCS um, and working out uh, what the requirements of that are in terms of mapping those on to be able to use the 5G system as FRMCS. Uh, and then in the next slide, we have some more coming uh, from SA1. Um, we have um, a bit related to URLLC in RAN. We have uh, timing resiliency services uh, for 5G to bring new sources of timing into 5G and therefore provide new uh, businesses with the ability to use a 5G timing, uh, whether these are smart grid utilities that we heard about before, but also the financial sector, uh, which needs extremely accurate timing for its, its trading purposes. Um, and to be able to have a, a referenceable uh, version of time. So you know where it's come from and you know how accurate it is and how this should be distributed over 5G. I have some more type of IoT, uh, which is being referred to in SA1 as personal IoT. Uh, this is the kind of wearable network you might have around your body in the future and smart home automation um, and, and uh, what, we, what requirements we need to impose on 5G uh, to be able to support those. Um, and then um, it's a, a bit different than the others maybe, but there's um, this sharing of administrative configurations uh, between MCS systems, uh, which is so that when an emergency service or a mission critical service, uh, perhaps for example, crosses the border between the regions and countries and the device turns up in another region, but still needs to receive configurations from its home region uh, or from both regions, um, how should these mission critical services um, be able to interact uh, using the 3GPP 5G system. So this is a rapid run through of some things that are of particular relevance to verticals in, in SA1. Now, some of these will trickle down to RAN in release 18. Um, some may take longer. Um, some of them produce numerical requirements of the kind that Eric was showing before. Um, and some of them produce um, qualitative requirements or protocol requirements. Um, so we tend to take these SA1 items and divide them up into different responsibilities in the RAN working groups especially where I'm from in RAN 1, we're often very numerical, uh, but the protocol layers in terms of um, quality of service and recovery and all of these things, uh, RAN 2 and RAN 3 spend a lot of their effort uh, deriving how to build a radio for those kind of SA1 requirements. Uh, so 
a very high level view there of, uh, of the 3GPP pipeline for 17 and 18. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. That was really interesting. Congratulations on all the work that's being done for the um, for the verticals. And I think a very important point that you mentioned about, you know, SA1 and it being the glimpse into the future. And I think this, for anyone who's been following us in either the workshops or the webinar series since early 2019, I think this workshop is really important to kind of capture the complete picture of 3GWP of where you know from your starting point to as you move into um, the run activities. So thank you for that. So um, I think the next, uh, oh sorry, no, that I know the next um, presenter will be Tara Fasonen from the Critical uh, Communications Association. So the floor is yours. So thank you very much. Here I have actually uh, taken the, the critical communication sector. Uh, input for release release 17. I've saved the release 18 input more for the, the second sec section. But what's what's quite important here for critical communication sec sectors in large, be it now the utilities or the or or uh, railways, but but most of all public safety are the drivers here. Uh, coverage, availability, resilience, performance, stability and functional suitability. Starting with the coverage unless you have connection, unless it's always available, unless you can trust the connection and it does what, what's required, it's no good. And then it has to scale, scale up in particular in shared networks that it still operates when, when, when something else is happening. And fi fun, uh, finally, it actually needs also to address the needs on the field, whether, whether that's, that's now the emergency calling in, uh, in railways or uh, uh, multi-agency fire incident in, in public safety. The key requirement we had in release 17 was to make the mission critical functionality supported over 5G and R. Most of all, to make sure that, that in those networks where critical communication users are utilizing these services, they will not be the hindering factor for the uh, mobile operators to move on to, for, uh, to further releases, to move on from LTE to, to 5G, 6G, and so on. So it's important that every, I would say in general, that every vertical is always uh, has the ability to, to, from a standards point of view, to use the, the newest generation so that they are not stuck somewhere, somewhere in the past, preventing the uh, other stakeholders to move on. On the uh, marketing tech, then, on the other hand, I think that this should be also a, a fairly common requirement for all the verticals, is, is the ability to, to test the, uh, the functionalities which are relevant for, for that particular vertical. And now in RAN, RAN 5, the testing is focused on, on uh, end devices, and we would like to propose and see that extended to be more end-to-end -end type of testing uh, including the servers as well, so that we can verify and eventually certify and have interoperability and multi-vendor market for those uh, end-to-end services, which is a requirement most of all from government type of uh, stakeholders in order to purchase products. So to make, make sure that the market actually happens, that we are envisaging and making all this great effort in standardization, we need to bring it to the, to the very end also on the testing side. More uh, than on the actual features which, which were re relevant in SA and, and RAN were the things related to the, to the operational model over 5G. Communication at all times, everywhere, that's the device-to-device -device communication, including uh, UE network relay, satellite connectivity, and that kind of things in release seven, 17 timeframe. In release 18, these are to, to continue location services and, and again anything that can be done to extend coverage but also to make sure that the, the capacity is there when when it's re required and that was most of all re uh, referring to multi-cast broadcast capabilities uh, we're quite happy to see uh, the cooperation in 3gpp with 
between all the stakeholders. We're seeing that their work is ongoing in, in basically all of these. At the same time, uh, it needs to continue also in the, in the future in release 18 and, and certainly uh, after that in order to, order to make the society safe. I suppose this is uh, what I was to say for the uh, se se session one. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this is when everyone I think will appreciate just what an important um, sector this is. And I think that, you know, the COVID pandemic has proven this more and more so. So thank you very much and congratulations on your work and all the best for your future activities. We'll now pass the floor to Thierry, who is going to tell us a little bit more, some other multiple, multiple vertical perspectives from a RAM point of view as a specialist. So thank you very much. Yeah, so I, I just want to outline that, uh, um, so verticals, uh, they need more and more telecom, but also they are part of, of the future of telecom. And they are effectively important for 3GPP as well to maintain this as the most relevant global standardization body for telecom. Uh, um, therefore, I think we believe that it is very important to be, for Vertical to be involved in the release 18 scope with these three phases. Uh, so we have this initial discussion in June. In September, there will be a consolidation, but then in, in December, there will be the finalization. Yeah. Uh, so just to, to outline, 3GPP, there's still many challenges specifically for verticals. Uh, um, and it, it, there is a, sometimes a lack of correlation between standard and, and market. Uh, there is especially a gap between the release process and existing deployment. Uh, um, still, the, 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 the mass market was still prioritized. So this is under change. Uh, also, thank to 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 the the impulse of of uh, someone like like Wanshi, uh, is where the market and uh, the verticals will be more and more represented. Um, there is the, of course, the need of resource to be involved, and and current issue is that very few verticals are involved and and not aligned. So it's challenging to get through the three GPP roadmap and priorities. However. Uh, 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 I would like to outline that influence is possible and, and that and there are key factors for a vertical to achieve uh, this this influence is really attending permanently consistently contributing in consist uh, with consistency really going from the the different stage uh, with valid use case valid uh, kpi with real data and the involvement in the working group is quite crucial and, and, and rewarding. So for uh, in SI1, of course, but in RAN, it's RAN1, RAN2. Uh, there, there is, they welcome also the input of, of the vertical and, and it really it has an influence on, on how the, the, the group uh, and, uh, and how the, 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 the standard is driven. And of course, you should seek support of traditional telecom player and, and raising a market issue outside of 3GPP like we are doing now. So these, these are the list of, of what are the vertical input, but I, I, for automotive, for release 18, for critical communication, for media broadcast. Uh, so, uh, so you see that there are, uh, there are some, some input. Uh, I will come back to that, but, but basically, uh, uh, there is 23 contributions that are vertical driven over 511 uh, uh, contributions in, in RAN. Uh, maybe uh, it seems a bit, uh, let's say, small, and maybe verticals are still not enough represented. Uh, I, I will outline a bit what are key RAN enablers for verticals and what, what are the different verticals that could be involved. Uh, so we have a couple of, of enablers, and that, that's, that's what is important. Uh, um, so, for example, we have 5G, MBS, and ProZ. This is an usage of EMBB, uh, media broadcast and public safety, very, uh, very impacted, very concerned, very active uh, currently. We have Sidelink, which is uh, in the, the UE to UE type of communication. 
but so far the focus is only on EMBB. Potential, there are a lot of potential uh, vertical impact uh, concern impacted. However, at the moment it's mostly driver, driven by, by automotive and, and, and public safety. Um, some of the railway requirements that were outlined by, um, um, by Mathieu in some way are, are currently not supported by, by, uh, by Sidelink. And, and IoT also is not uh, really supported by, uh, by Sidelink. So, uh, just to outline this. Some other uh, 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 key enabler, we have NRNTN, which is the satellite part. So the usage is EMBB, but also a cross function because uh, it presents uh, um, the opportunity to do uh, backhauling. Uh, so potentially all the verticals should be really impacted, concerned, but in some extent, uh, uh, let's say the, 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 the there is a limited vertical involvement where the, there is a, uh, maybe a lack of of, of uh, description of of use case and 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 some vertical do not really let's say prioritize or, or, or outline the the need. But we have seen today a, a bit uh, some vertical expressing this. But um, but it seems that in, currently in 3GPP. Uh, it lacks a bit of of, uh, of support, and I believe that it would be uh, uh, more uh, um, more worth it to have more support from from vertical uh, on, on this topic. Similar uh, EMTC, which is the, the massive IoT, uh, we had many vertical impacted. Uh, so far, uh, with the current IoT, there is no more really vertical involved. And as I mentioned uh, before, um, on, on uh, UE to UE, uh, Sidelink uh, IoT is currently not supported by by 3GPP. So, uh, so uh, it, it is a limitation, uh, and, and and this limitation in some way uh, exists because the, the vertical have not expressed this uh, this need uh, specifically. Then there is the IoT by satellite. Uh, again, many industry and vertical are impacted. Uh, um, so far, uh, um, vertical that have been a, a bit supporting and addressing uh, uh, this topic are, are utility, thanks to uh, UTC, uh, EDF, uh, pushing this uh, and, and promoting this, this idea that there is a, a need to support, for example, a critical infrastructure. Uh, maybe more important, uh, as Matthew also pointed out, uh, or put an emphasis of, on REDCAP. REDCAP is typical uh, um, activity, which is really impacting a major uh, or a vertical perspective. It's uh, device driven. It's a kind of, it's a broadband IoT. So the uh, main uh, verticals impacted are, uh, are industry 4.0 uh, utilities, but so far we do not see uh, a, a direct involvement of, of vertical. And, and, uh, and uh, in some way, uh, if the result uh, at the end of, of the, the, the development of Redcap do not meet the expectation of the, ver the vertical, uh, it would be it's maybe by a lack of of of, of involvement. Uh, URLC also uh, a, a bit similar. Uh, a, a lot of of uh, um, mention about URLC, but but so far the, the participation, except Industry 4.0, uh, has been a bit limited because the the, the vertical have other priorities. Uh, as I outlined a bit before. 511 contribution, only 23, maybe uh, slightly more if uh, if I, I I dig a, a bit deeper. Uh, uh, 23 that are oriented vertical perspective seems a bit uh, a bit I would say a bit small, uh, uh, and and many vertical enabler uh, seem to be without vertical involvement or even just uh, just a support or just saying 
yes, we we believe in this this type of enabler, and this is key for uh, uh, for our um, vertical uh, perspective. Uh, it should be more uh, outlined. Uh, the two examples that I gave, Redcap and, and NTN, the, the satellite, which is 5G or, or IoT, uh, it, this should should be. A, it's they are a game changer for for vertical. They are opening other uh, perspective uh, uh, about also resilience, about uh, uh, support of of uh, uh, of service in 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 a remote area for NTN. Redcap uh, very much oriented. Uh, um, broadband IoT for the needs of, of verticals. So it is a bit surprising not to see uh, so uh, as much as support as we could expect from vertical. So the, the, our conclusion would be that there is really a need for more coordination between verticals to support more efficiently this, this key enabler, uh, even if it's not a, a direct involvement it, it should be uh, probably also be uh, thanks to this type of workshop. Uh, it's, we should more outline uh, and, 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 and have a common view about all these key enablers and, and how important they are for, uh, for the vertical perspective. Yeah, lovely. Thank you very much, Tim. I think you made some really interesting points about, you know, the involvement of verticals in different areas of standardization work and I think that's really important and let's try and understand which which ones really are the new priorities or the priorities that we should be pushing forward from now on so John will now launch a second poll um, and then we'll take a little bit of a break because we're going to open up the well we're going to give every participant the ability to unmute when the time is right, you will, you will get a nudging from us. But I do think, and there's one more thing I want to add, I think the discussion that was triggered about the energy and how important it might be also across verticals, that is, that is triggering a lot of, of an interesting comments and questions in the, in the Q&A panel and elsewhere. So thank you very much. This is what we need to have. This is what we need to see. You know, let's keep going. Um, you may be in a so thank you all very much. So John, let's go with the with the next panel, uh, the poll, and then we'll move on to panel two and the interactive. The next panel, um, the next session isn't quite as busy as this as the first one has been. But yeah, so the question is again all about um, comparing specific requirements, and we've seen some really good examples of this actually already. We would like to know if you in the audience have already done this okay yes it's good to see 16 percent 60 percent i have already against 40 that haven't uh, let's hope that our workshop will also help you do this and there's also we we always find that well however far we go in the work that we do there's always something new to do and we thrive on that new challenge um. Please go to slide number three. Number three? three. Ah, okay. No, sure. sorry, yeah. We did the introduction already. Okay, that's true. Uh, so 5G ASEA has the mission to ensure the best possible applicability of 5G technology and 5G networks for the manufacturing process industries. So what you usually know as smart manufacturing or industry for the zero. And this is done by addressing, discussing, and evaluating relevant technical, regulatory, and business aspects. And on this slide, you see the current structure. And on the left-hand side, you see Working Group 1, which looks into use cases and requirements, and also for RAND technology, Working Group 3 for architecture and technology is also very important. Next slide, please. This is some history that Pachias here joined as a free GPP market representation partner already in November 2018, very early in the history of on the life of Practice Here, Next slide, please. This is some cut out of some achievements of our work. We were fundamental in working on the uh, 
technical specifications in SA1 for requirements and use cases for um, control applications or cyber physical control application, usually the CAF uh, work items or ECAF or CyberCAF, which includes the manufacturing use cases, industry policy, but also some control applications from the smart grid sector, also from audio video production, as well as from the healthcare sector. There was also a panel some time ago changing 3GPP to help the verticals where my colleague Joachim Valeski, who was fundamental in setting up these work items, was participating. Uh, there are also some other contributions, for instance, a general model for industrial environments to the run working groups. Next slide, please. These are some, some general thoughts on the release 18 requirements. So many industrial requirements are included in the 16 and 70 3GPP SA1 documents. You've seen them on the previous slide. These are not all, or not all of these requirements are as uh, with the values we would like to have them, but it's a very good collection of uh, requirements which would enable 5G to be used in the industrial context. However, not all of these requirements are already cover covered in the technical specifications in the downstream groups, so there's still something to be done. And the major focus is actually dependability and determinism. These are key and all the industrial requirements are sort of related to these two things, dependability and determinism. So it's really important that the KPIs are guaranteed if they are not or if something goes wrong, you, have a, you might have a very big physical damage in your factory. One other thing which is a problem is the, what I would like to call the availability gap. So if you look into the market, release 15 hardware is currently started to being rolled out, at least for industrial purposes. And the testing of release 15 or 16, which would have the first industrial enhancements, that would actually provide insights on required enhancements and improvements of 5G advance. So it's really needed that verticals or industry can actually test the product and see what is missing, what is good, what should be improved. The other thing is that also the development and the progress is also going on in the industrial area and industrial application. And so new, five, new industrial 5G use cases or industrial use cases in general will lead to further specific requirements for enhancements in free GPP also these are reflected in ongoing pack GRCR work. And another thing is that the traceability or tracking of the vertical requirements in the free TPP downstream work, that would be really helpful for verticals to follow and to participate better in free TPP. So as mentioned by a previous speaker, it's difficult for verticals to follow. Usually free TPP is not the main uh, sensation body so limited resources, so here it would be very helpful to, to be able to focus on the actual things and see where those things are handled and go on in the process. And for the session one, oh, we, we put up some example use cases in order to motivate the requirements. So we see an increased demand in the uplink services. When the requirements were done in release 16, 17, that was 2018 and 19, there was the general impression, yes, there's uplink traffic, but it's only small data, uh, data rates. This is changing, the data rates are increasing, uplink services are becoming more demanding. We are currently discussing if the current technology is sufficient or if enhancements are needed. Low power, for instance, for positioning is an essential or is increasingly important. Your LSC enhancements to really have these low latencies reliably in arbitrary deployments with an increasing number of your LSCUEs and with increasing capacity requirements also to support mixed service or multimodality service. So if communication streams or communication services are related, are not really, are not really independent, but are related somehow, how is this handled? Can this be handled meet these improvements or enhancements in the network? Now, an important thing is network exposure to see what is happening in the network or where might be uh, error happened. 
Yeah, I would like to point to a new 5G SCI white paper on the exposure of 5G capabilities for industrial applications. You'll see the link here. And also process lighting communication for industrial IoT becomes more attention. It's more like an innovative, innovative topic. So you can run factories or many industrial use cases also without process, but it promises some improvements in some specific deployments like cooperative carrying by a group of mobile robots. That's the template for session one. On the left-hand side, you see some high-level priority inputs, which are handled by RAN, or mainly by RAN, I was rather general. And the first three are very essential for having 5G in an industrial environment. Low latencies, these are done, but as mentioned before, only Having the hardware and testing the hardware in the production will actually show if it has been sufficient. But what I've learned from the specifications, it looks really promising. But you know, capacity is never sufficient. So there are probably some enhancements into that direction. TSN, time sensitive communication, time synchronization, that's also very essential. We have really 17 many functionalities of time synchronization and TSN support have been available, so I'm looking forward to having a release 17 industrial IoT network with TSN support. There are still some further TSN functionalities like distributed TSN configuration, which are missing. Also better time synchronization would be nice. Non-public networks, there might be some enhancements. We are currently looking into which one these might be, but it's taken up and we are also very happy that this is now in the 3TPP standardization uh, standard. QS monitoring is important. It's done, but it's only partially done to my impression here. Further QS monitoring, more parameters, network exposure interface improvement that would be necessary. Process cycling, as I mentioned before, is an innovative add-on. This has not been taken up for the industrial domain only 17. Positioning is there, but it's only the first positioning levels and here are clear improvements in the accuracy, in the security, and in the air, uh, energy consumption. That's for session one. Thank you very much, Michael, and congratulations also to you. And thank you again to the 5G SIA. You've been really important in pushing forward this um, event series. So thanks again for that. So now that we've all cooled down a little bit, let's um, move on to session two. So we're going to start, as I mentioned before, with Maxine Flamont, who will give us then a, an intro, thanks John, super quick as always, um, who will give you a really good idea of what some of these common requirements are. So the floor is yours, Maxime, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, um, now, um, I, I I wouldn't say I'm going to give an overview of uh, for for everyone. I'm I'm giving the essentially an overview of what are the inputs of uh, 5GA from the automotive perspective uh, to 3GBP uh, for the release 18. Uh, and these slides are actually posted as a contribution to the workshop uh, that is happening next week. So. I, and um, I, I would say 5GA uh, experience with 3GPP has been a, a very good one. And so one that I would uh, recommend to all the different verticals that we see uh, uh, presenting today. Uh, we have been active for many different releases. Uh, and we have been successful in release 14 on putting um, uh, substantial uh, uh, con uh, contributions for the, the side link definition on LT, so LT V2X, and then release uh, 16 with the NR V2X. And for that, uh, we really um, uh, are thankful to the, to, 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 to the fact that uh, our members are uh, very active in 3GPP and uh, are supporting our, um, our wish. So, um, even though earlier we, we saw that only 23 uh, uh, verticals uh, have been submitted, uh, no, have, uh, have, 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 have been uh, every, oh, uh, sorry, uh, 23 inputs have been uh, put into uh, the, the workshop. 
I'm pretty sure that a lot of our uh, members and a lot of our respective members are very active uh, promoting uh, what the different associations are um, uh, wishing for, let's say. Um, so from our scope, we are focused on the connectivity solutions for automotive. Uh, we are addressing technical business regulatory challenges. So it's a li little bit going beyond 3GPP. Um, we are also looking at uh, business models and go to markets. Uh, and, and it's important to know that cv 2 is now, uh, as of uh, release 14, it, it is in development in different countries and several milestones in US and active deployments is happening as we speak in China. So, so a good journey for, from our side. Yes. Uh, so, um, so uh, the, the process that we have um, had in 5GAA for the release 18 has been I must say a little bit more complicated than, than usual. Uh, we uh, we had in total 35 different proposals from, from our members uh, as inputs. We put them together uh, into categories and then we prioritize them. Uh, we look at the subtopics. We looked at the relevance of these subtopics for each of these categories. Uh, and they were consolid consolidated in this uh, set of slides. Um, it is uh, w widely actually aligned among our members. That means that uh, we did uh, in the survey uh, that we did, we looked at the different sectors that were answering and, and we realized that um, actually the ranking is almost the same, whether it is uh, from the automotive sector and the mobile network operator sector or the, the telco sector in general. So that, this is the slide that is showing the eight retained um, categories uh, of, of, um, of features or requirements that are proposed uh, to the workshop next week. Um, positioning enhancement is still uh, uh, quite high on our, on our attention. Um, we are still experiencing uh, pretty, difficult, pretty high difficulties uh, to um, even uh, consider some use cases if we don't uh, achieve the positioning requirements that we are uh, being uh, posed from the automotive sector. Uh, the second one is on siding co-channel uh, coexistence. As you know, LTV2X, uh, release 1415, and NRV2X are not uh, the same uh, um, uh, not not the same uh, radio access technologies. They are uh, they will uh, in theory uh, operate in two different ch uh, channels. Uh, now we are considering the possibility to have co-channel coexistence, and we would like 3GPP to look at this seriously. Uh, the sidelink carrier aggregation uh, that I'm I'm going to say a little bit more word later essentially intraband carrier aggregations and interband uh, fr1 fr1 yeah, carrier integrations uh, enhancements to the siding power savings so release 17 did quite a lot uh, on that but uh, we there are still some aspects that are that need to be considered still some work on predictive quality of service um, then uh, UE to UE relay, uh, uh, looking at the side link uh, capabilities and uh, uh, making sure that uh, there are some uh, situations where uh, the uh, relay can be uh, useful in some use cases. Um, NR V2X side link adjacent uh, channel coexistence with non 3GPP technologies. In general, uh, non 3 gpp technologies have not really been considered uh, as such in in the in in the work items of of uh, 3 gpp but in this case uh then we, we are exposed to the fact that we have non 3 gpp technologies in in the uh, channels and some coexistence for adjacent channel coexistence needs to be investigated and then finally um the um, uh, distributed antenna systems um uh, is an important topic for the automotive, and we would like to look at some enhancements on that. Uh, I'll go quickly on these. Uh, bear with me, John. Uh, so the positioning enhancement, uh, we are looking at 
mechanism to enhance position accuracy, even uh, in the case of out of coverage or partial coverage or in coverage. So, so um, for example, in in coverage situations, we would like to see how we can optimally combine U U and side link positioning modes. We would like, uh, and that's related to another another point. Look also at what happens when we have distributed antenna systems on the uh, UE, that means on the vehicle, uh, for the po positioning enhancement. And uh, um, look also at the posi positioning features in unlicensed spectrum to avoid any impact on the V2X uh, spectrum use. Uh, for side link co channel coexistence, I think that I said what I needed to say. Uh, very important for us to uh, show that uh, LT V2X and NR V2X could or can, uh, in some cases, uh, operate in the same channel um, in a non harmful way. Uh, the side link car carrier aggregation, I mentioned the intraband non contiguous carrier aggregation intraband contiguous carrier aggregation and then finally interband uh, carrier aggregation between fr1 and fr1 bands uh, which would be a combination for example of a dits band or uh, with an unlicensed band or with a license license band that's up to you but here we focus still on the fr1 uh, not not uh, not more on the uh, enhancement to siding power saving uh, there are some features that are still uh, very very appealing for the automotive market but uh, i believe for others uh, for su such as the uh, wake up or go to sleep or adaptive drx and these kind of features that uh, enable a very um refined uh, use cases that are uh, appealing to the consumers a predictive quality of service we have already talked about it but um in the previous releases but uh, here siding and and uu reporting uh, needs to be a bit more accurate uh, finer granular reporting for the end-to-end -end, uh, reporting of the quality of service uh, is important and so some additional uh, need is there U, UE to UE relay um, for V2X operation and then uh, adjacent channel coexistence uh, with non 3 GPP and then that's the final one on the vehicular uh, DAS uh, where um, we want to include enhancements for vehicular DAS for example sending the side link and uplink signal channel only from an the antenna panel achieving the best performance for the target receive, receiver basically uh, some some fine tuning here to to be done otherwise um, that's that's it from our side and i hope that uh, summarize well what the 5g automotive association would like to yeah. see in the next uh, release thanks yeah. Thanks very much, Maxime, for your leadership as always. What I meant when I introduced you was that I did some guest research and most of these common requirements came out from 5G AA and 5G ACIA. So that was my point. Yeah, you're always one step ahead. Thank you on some of the big issues because you, your journey has been a longer one also as well. Um, I think yeah, that, and then Stephanie, yeah. Stephanie, I, I, and and I, I have been the one perhaps over the last three years when we started yes. this uh, to to say we need more verticals in this um, in these yes. kind of meetings, and I'm very glad to see so many verticals now represented expressing their needs, mm. and um, and so uh, the the more the merrier, I would say, uh, yeah. and uh, and so we 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 don't feel competition, we see just uh, co competition here. Yeah. I think so, I totally agree. And we will be getting some new members coming in as well. I can't say who they will be, but we will are bringing in some more verticals in the near future. So thanks again, Maxine. Okay, I think next up should be Andrea, so we can move on. We don't have many presentations, guys. We will get to that interactive discussion soon. So thank you, Andrea, as well, and your colleagues also for your inputs here. Thank you, thank you, John. That was super fast. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon for uh, uh, European people as well. Um, here we rank uh, uh, about uh, these uh, sort of uh, these KPIs and this characteristic that the network uh, 
should have from the most important to the less important for us. I remind you that uh, the project that, that I'm coordinating, 5G Solutions, is, uh, um, has some verticals, in particular the Industry 4.0, the um, Smart Energy, Smart Ports, all of these, all of these uh, uh, three uh, leading labs, uh, so verticals, uh, has uh, the um, capability of internet, uh, industrial internet of things, uh, and the necessity of the ultra reliable and the low latency. Uh, so uh, I put on the first place uh, uh, these. Uh, then future proof devices, because the device is very expensive, and of course uh, uh, they should be future proof, uh, wh where future proof means uh, also uh, upgradable. Uh, that uh, for some parts uh, can be uh, remain the same, but uh, from a network point of view, can be upgradable. Uh, then, uh, as I, um, I uh, told before, uh, there is the importance of the enforcing metric uh, connectivity. In particular, the upload should be very similar to the, the download in terms of bit rate. Uh, positioning enhancement, in particular, for the port, the logistics. Um, new radio multicast, uh, in particular, because we have a, a use case related to the media and entertainment, the uh, multi source of a video. So, several people are in the stadium, for instance, and with uh, the mobile can provide uh, a professional, a semi professional video. Um, no public networks because uh, they are important for uh, uh, the um, industrial plant. And then the less important the predictive QoS, important but is not essential for us, uh, side link enhancement and the scenario for satellite usage. I really uh, be impressed from my colleague of, uh, about satellite, but uh, mm, to be honest, a word that outside my, my scope and the scope of the research of, of the project that I'm coordinating. Uh, here, uh, I think that uh, uh, is not so um, important to, to understand this because uh, I already uh, told what is written in this slide uh, and are the reason for the importance uh, and uh, what is back. Uh, of the ranking that I presented before. Uh, here, the most important rose is the first one. If you uh, forgot my name, I uh, would like to thank my colleagues Gianni Romano and Maria Piagalante for the support because they're not really expert in the standards and uh, uh, they are and uh, um, they support me in producing material. Uh, thank you very much, Stephanie. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Andrea. Yeah, and also, we, yeah, I reiterate that thank you to your yeah. colleagues. Yeah, absolutely important. So, thank you. Okay, we'll move on now then to Hannigan, um, and we'll go look at the, what the common requirements are in the maritime sector. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Hi, Stephanie. Hello. <laughs> I provided the 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 the. the explanation of why uh, three features here are important. Satellite enhancement and satellite and multi-rod, multi-connectivity. Three features are important features to enhance the communication coverage at sea, where it is not impossible to easily deploy the network infrastructure uh, compared to on-land situation. The satellite enhancement including site link positioning is ranked as the first priority considering the availability of current maritime communication technology at sea because it is assumed that uh, more than 20 or 30 years will be taken to be migrated into the provision of the maritime communication over five seven years in case of uh, direct communication side link uh, 
uh, there is the solution to provide the direct communication between investors without the network infrastructure, but with the, the very limited service and low performance at sea. In order to support emerging requirement from a coming new business at sea, the revolutionary enhancement of existing direct communication between investors is inevitably uh, requested. In addition, it is very critical to have positioning of investors and people on board requested to be rescued when any accident happens during the navigation at sea regardless of whether there is any network infrastructure around the buses or not. Therefore, side link enhancement, including a side link positioning, is ranked as the first priority. The currently ongoing 3CPP work on NR side link enhancement need to be continuously enhanced to provide more optimized performance to maritime communication environment where much longer distance need to be supported, earth coverture need to be considered, and other potential impact from antenna height and the sea surface wave along with vessel movement need to be analyzed. Satellite access is the essential feature required to support broad coverage at sea, but it was ranked as a second priority because of the following reason. The solution based on the legacy satellite access technology are also expected to be enhanced to provide better performance required for the emerging of new businesses at sea, such as autonomous ships or oceanic farming at sea. So the alternative solutions based on the enhancement of legacy satellites are shown to be available for the time being until satellite solutions are migrate to what 3 cpp are to be standardized for satellite access over 5 and beyond. And assuming the ship's life on average 20 or 30 years, Legacy maritime communication technologies will coexist with upcoming new maritime communication technology over 5 and beyond. Therefore, it is required to support the multi rod and multi connectivity, They're ranked as a third priority, considering the communication between legacy type of vessels and new type of vessels such as autonomous ships. Uh, the previous slide the, touched the, the, the coverage expansion topic, but this slide provides uh, uh, some features to uh, be required for maritime domain. Position enhancement is ranked as a first priority because positioning is an essentially required feature next after the coverage expansion feature as the then predictive QS is ranked as a fifth priority because of few network infrastructures at sea and potential communication disruption from sea weather, such as unavailability of satellite access, etc. If it is possible to inform an autonomous ship of whether radio link is disconnected in your future, Autonomous ships can prepare for other navigation mode in advance before the unavailability of external communication method connecting to things or users on land occurs. Next, the NR multicast broadcast is ranked as a sixth priority because multicast and broadcast communication is one of efficient communication technology to enable a vessel to communicate with other vessels around that vessel under the restriction of the network infrastructure as well. And IIoT and URLC is ranked as the seventh priority and non-public 
network is ranked as an A priority because both features are expected to be operated covered to communication among IoT device inside a vessel whose size is more than a few hundred features. And that's my presentation. Thank you for the pay attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And best of luck with what comes next. Um, so we'll now pass the floor to Matthew. Um, this is one of our precious brand specialists in the panel today. So thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for, for waiting uh, for me here. Uh, so um, uh, we wanted to um, raise in interest on a, a technology that might be of interest to a, a few verticals. Um, passive IoT, uh, which has been mentioned in a few papers uh, going into the uh, the 3GPP RAN workshop. Uh, so I thought I'd uh, sort of highlight this to you. Uh, so um, passive IoT um, being devices without batteries um, is why we, we call them passive. So uh, what might we seek to replace as some typical industrial cases? Uh, well, on, on the left-hand side, um, even replacing barcodes is uh, quite attractive. Uh, for barcodes, you have to print them out, you have to stick them on. And once you've done that, when you want to find the asset or the package, uh, essentially a human has to scan them um, uh, in line of sight and one by one. And there's, there's not really uh, another method for dealing with barcodes. So they are uh, very inefficient um, and uh, rather time consuming. So if we can replace at similar cost as a barcode, with a passive IoT tag that is a stick-on um, tag to a box that connects to the indoor cellular network in a, in a warehouse or, or a distribution center. Uh, and because now we can use cellular network, um, a local cellular network to deal with this, it is possible to automate it and run it hundreds of times faster uh, than it would be by hand. And um, a more industrial uh, case on the right-hand side, uh, this picture in the middle is taken from a cement factory. Uh, I've never been to a cement factory, uh, but they apparently have many sensors in them for temperature, pressure, speed, uh, motor current, um, and uh, many other things. Um, but the problem is if you're going to do these with conventional sensors, then for them to be battery operated, you have the cost of the batteries and the problem of replacing them. Um, the problem of them running down along the way and possibly falling out of service. You have a physical limitation, which anybody from IoT is, is familiar with, where the device size is effectively limited by the battery size, which is limited by the, the long lifetime you want them to have. And despite the battery lifetime, uh, the drain current in the background, you have quite infrequent transmissions from these devices. So it, it's not a very efficient use of a battery uh, to have these uh, rare transmissions from some sensors. Um, over their lifetime. And then you also have nowadays to uh, consider the fact that batteries contain lithium and lead and, and other things, um, which are not easy to uh, recycle and replace. Whereas if we were able to make a passive device, uh, which could rely on energy harvesting, uh, perhaps from uh, solar or from ambient light or from vibrations or from uh, local RF, then they become self-sustaining, needing no power supply. They can be highly miniaturized um, because of the circuitry uh, that can be used. There is no particular lifetime limit. They can continue uh, until they suffer from wear and tear. Um, and for using what is ambient around the place in energy harvesting, they are very eco-friendly. So th this is um, two examples of where uh, having uh, no battery and very low cost uh, is very attractive. Now, this is not currently supported in the 3GPP set of the system where we tend to assume a fairly conventional transceiver, even when we're dealing with, say, narrowband IoT or REDCap. Um, fundamentally, there's a fairly conventional RF transceiver in there. Then the requirements uh, to be able to enable a cellular uh, passive IoT network, well, you need to have a cost which is not significantly higher than a barcode, which is almost nothing, uh, perhaps one cent of a dollar. You need to have a power consumption, which is at the microwatts level. Um, if you're not going to have batteries and rely on energy harvesting, um, then even a, a narrowband IoT transmitter uses 
uh, tens or hundreds of milliwatts, and we need to go a factor of perhaps a thousand lower than that. And the coverage in networking has to match what is deployed indoors for 5G. Uh, now you would think that, that RFID might be uh, a candidate uh, for matching the coverage, but the trouble with RFID um, is that you need quite dense readers. The typical range of an RFID reader is something like 10 meters or, or so. Um, and for having them so dense, you have an interference problem where one reader is activating its target tag, uh, interferes with what is being received by its neighboring reader from its recently targeted tag. Um, and there's no uh, control of interference in RFID. So you have the problem of needing a dense network, but that causing interference. So uh, the passive IoT from a cellular network point of view uh, has to provide coverage without interference uh, and networking uh, without the problem of devices uh, colliding with each other. Um, and of course, this is exactly what cellular networks do. Um, by the time you have cross-link interference management and, and measurement and central coordination, uh, you, you have exactly that design in the cellular network. So for passive IoT, uh, we need UV power consumption um, of, of 100 microwatts or less, UV cost of, of a tenth of a dollar or a hundredth of a dollar or less. And so it, it fits really at the bottom of this pyramid of things that 3GPP have produced. We have NR right at the top, conventionally MPB. We have the various simplifications that we've made in 3GPP right down to narrowband IoT so far. But we need to go much further even than that, which we, we think is enabled by passive IoT because of the ability to, uh, to have no battery, to use ambient energy, um, and to have an extremely small size. Uh, now, of course, this is quite a lot of change for the cellular network um, in order to do this. Um, but perhaps the first thing uh, to, to mention is, is what's inside a device such as this. How, how do you even get started? Uh, there, there's a few things that actually uh, uh, RAN1 especially would need to look into. Uh, but two of the common techniques that you, you find in, in literature for this uh, are envelope detection in the downlink, which is a non-coherent technique. Um, and for that, you don't need the uh, mixing of the received RF signal with local carrier waves. Now, this means that you can strip out the RF chain, so you don't need oscillators, mixers, and, and DACs. Um, you have uh, a very simple circuit that, that most of us encounter at the, the beginning of, of university studies at the latest. It's that simple. Um, you can use modulation of on-off keying, and you can have power consumption as low as a microwatt uh, for this. So uh, this is very effective um, potentially for the downlink. Now, of course, if you have spent time looking at the radio protocols uh, in 3 p you can see that this is quite a big change. You'd have work in round one and work in round four. Uh, but we think that the, the, the return on this in, in, say, 5G advanced timelines of 2025 is, is worth doing. And then on the uplink, uh, we have um, uh, uh, backscattering is, is quite a common technique, uh, where you have, a, you can see on, in the, the figure at the bottom right, you have a, uh, the, the ability to store a certain amount of energy from the, the incoming RF. Uh, and the tag basically modulates and reflects the received carrier wave to transmit the uplink data and therefore has an extremely low power consumption of its own. Uh, the RF front end, at least in principle, can be reduced to a single transmit transistor, uh, and therefore having very low cost indeed. So uh, although if 3 gpp uh, were to begin a study in this, uh, certainly it would want to study more broadly than only envelope detection and backscattering. Uh, the, the reason that I, I put this here is to show that uh, although you would need plenty of changes to the 3 gpp radio, uh, in, in fact, it's not as far away as it seems because there are these quite well-established techniques in the literature uh, to, to get you started. So I think in the name of the times and the time zones, I will keep you brief and stop there. Um, and thank you for letting me highlight this, this potential new uh, kind of technology for, for verticals. Hey, thank you, Matthew. This is super interesting. And, you know, we often, when we think about 5G in manufacturing, we think of the big, big, big companies, but I think, you know, you've highlighted how this could be relevant across lots of different kinds of manufacturing plants, small and large and by type. In our webinar on, on edge computing, we, for example, we talked about chemical plants. And 
I really feel that we, you know, this is a really good opportunity to kind of also show what the cost and, and many of the other benefits are across a really broad spectrum of manufacturing companies. So thank you very much for this. Well, now Maybe we I can answer the question from Izzy. Oh, yes, okay, yes, go ahead, thanks, well, that's great, yes. Thank you. And it ahead. doesn't fragment the market uh, yeah. uh, to answer your question because these uh, technologies are so much lower power, so much lower cost and have such different coverage than anything that 3GPP offers at the moment. Uh, that it adds a new layer of things that 3GPP do not currently support. Um, so it does not fragment, it expands. Super, very, a very fantastic job. Thank you very much, Matthew. Okay, so we'll now move on to, actually, we're going straight on back to the manufacturing company with, and this time uh, with Michael Barr. So thank you, Michael, for taking the floor. And I did just want to, before you start, Michael, I just, I would like to say that the 5G ACIA has always been very supportive of every single type of manufacturing company. Yeah, and the, there have always also been concerns how we involve also some of the smaller companies. But the floor is now yours. Thank you, uh, thank you, um, Michael. Yes, thank you. Um, this is for the template A part of the interactive session number two. It was ranking the priority requirements. And you see there's no ranking. There's just a list, which is some sort of ranking. But uh, as you also seen, the disclaimer ranking and specific requirements are still in the investigation at 5GSC. And we plan to provide an update later this year. The reason for this is simply that also the manufacturing industry or the industri industry as such is quite diverse. There are companies who are more on the process automation side, companies who are on the factory automation side, companies who build machines, companies who automate complete factories, who have a look at the factory, at logistics support, and so on. So different 5GSCI members have different priorities on these, and we are currently uh, looking into this and trying to find a common view on this and how to represent this. So, but what you can say, well, without providing an exact digital or discrete priority, we actually see more things like more in, or in very important requirements or vital requirements, important requirements, and then things which might be nice to have. And everything which is essential for having an automated factory with 5G, that would be a vital important requirement, which would be, for instance, non-public networks, enhancements here, and IIoT, of course, and URLSC, but also positioning. QS monitoring is sort of on the border, uh, depending on what you are looking at. It is important when you look at errors or um, to see how your factory behaves. Cycling is more like an enhancement. Multicast, we think it's a lot is there, but it might probably need some extensions. Multicast Ethernet support is also very essential for industrial networks, especially for the integration with uh, existing ones. Edge support, here we would also need to look into what is actually needed for the RAN side or from the RAN side, since Edge seems to be more in um, SA, an architectural topic. Predictive QoS and also scenarios for satellite usage are actually nice to have, but they are, from our point of view, not so really um, necessary for the operation. They are good in some scenarios, but not for the mess or for, for the major, majority of scenarios. It's simply a big disclaimer that we are still looking into this. The, Ranking chain will change, and also these high-level requirements are probably not specific enough for release 18 anymore. As you've seen, anything from release 16 and 17 is still important release 18, but of course 5G has evolved a lot, and there are many new functionalities in there. It probably needs to, it's very likely needs to be more specific what we would like to get from release 18. And as I already mentioned, we are currently having activities to discuss this and to do this, but this is still working progress and an update will be provided later this year. 
this is even more work in progress and even more preliminary. Um, this would be sort of a more specific set of requirements in these areas. Um, many of those things are already mentioned. Um, capacity increase is one thing, complexity reduction, improved positioning and accuracy. Uh, there are um, time synchronization improvements, um, cycling, multicast enhancements, but also network exposure and big services, as mentioned before. There are still new things coming up and uh, others might change their importance depending on the discussions. We really have to look into what is already there, what is really needed, uh, what are the actual numbers and what is maybe already supported by FFG. This will be discussed in fact just here from the industrial perspective. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. In fact, I think it's important to point out that, yeah, that the, the RAN also inputs our sort of stage across a certain time. But there is still a limited time to be able to contribute, but this, this um, the workshop next week is not the only meeting that will take place um, on release 18. So this is something to bear in mind. Um, we'll now pass, on, pass the floor back to the Public Safety and the Critical Communications Association. So the, um, we'll let um, Tara take the floor for this um, important topic. Thank you. So uh, here, I, uh, as, as we, one, one point to ma make first of all is obviously that this is a cooperation with, with PSC Europe. So it's, it's, that's good for, for all of us to remember. Uh, here, I did a, a bit of, bit of self-thinking and put this in certain order, order the, in our multicast broadcast there and the, on the top of the list, cycling enhancements, positioning enhancements, scenarios for satellite usage before the other, as those are all contributing to those main drivers here on the slide. Then in the, in the other, we have other things which also contribute to those drivers. And I, I believe they also, uh, like Thierry was presenting earlier, quite relevant for, for a number of other, other verticals. In our coverage enhancement, I believe that for all of us, if there's no connection, we don't have anything. So every time coverage can be improved, it's a, it's a plus. Uh, related is the mobile integrated access and backfall. Again, an alternative and a poss possibility to increase coverage. High power UE uh, under the one gigahertz bands other than band 14. Again, a capability to increase coverage in, in most of our rural areas. Then uh, here is the, the topic for, for the, which was mentioned by Ingo in the, in the railway sector, but this, this is also relevant for utilities, most of all in, in, in US as well as, as there's uh, on uh, two times three megahertz, just waiting and sitting unused, uh, which, is, which is allocated for, for public safety, which could, I believe, could be used, jointly shared use for, for also other, other verticals, provided we had technology to utilize it. And, and uh, that could, could, for instance, contribute to national uh, secure IoT, uh, capabilities. Timing, absolutely mandatory in order to keep, keep the positioning and other things working. Should we lose, lose uh, for any reason the, the timing, then basically nothing works for anybody. So, so that's quite an important thing to get, gain resilience there and, and with that contribute to avail, uh, availability. Then further, I believe also that we all agree, agree that we cannot perform at all, do, do what we are looking forward to do unless the systems are secure. So fundamentally, always security enhancements, wherever they are taking place, I believe that we, we all share a view in, in supporting those. Uh, then, then there are uh, the others which may not be in the, in the essence now at, the, at, the very, uh, at this very point, point of time. However, having said that, we need to remember that most of the input we, we are gathering today comes from um, national agencies, from shared networks, 
whereas say say my mining operation tactical operations and so on are quite interested in non-public networks so some they had they been more active this might be a slightly different order there's sim simply uh, a little bit pros on on why why this order is in place starting with the connectivity that it's the lifeline uh, and and moving on 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 with the capability to to the drivers as i explained already and mentioned already before uh, to to finalize i'd like to show actually uh, a slide from firstnet which is my next next topic there as as uh, as an input from one of the the members in the area uh, firstnet is the U.S. Public Safety National uh, uh, Government Public Safety Agency, and this is their top priority for run, run release 18 uh, workshop. Pretty much, much following the same same line as as I presented here, but with a little bit more explanation and 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 detail what uh, they are looking for from from particular uh, individual features whereas uh, I have been staying on a bit more abstract level. In general, uh, what I'm, I'm really encouraged about 3GPP is, is that a whole lot of functionalities that are being developed in the various, various releases contribute in a way or another to uh, critical communication sector and, and the users there. However, they are these clear, clear areas where uh, we need to move forward in order to provide the, the society safety. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Taryn. It's really nice to see this collaboration with the PSCE, which is one of the organising associations of this um, series. And also, you know, we've, all, we've always welcomed the inputs of the TZCA. And something that was quite interesting from the uh, discussions that we had back in July 2019, you know, we had somebody um, highlighted um, an issue with helicopters. And I think it kind of surprised the audiences because no one really understood their value as much as we've now been able to see in COVID, um, you know, with all of them delivering PPE and then the vaccines. And I've been talking to various health National Health Service providers about this. So, you know, I, I do stress again, this is an incredibly important um, uh, topic. So congratulations and our warmest wishes for whatever you manage to achieve in the future is super important. Thank you very much. So ladies and gentlemen, we, we, what we would like to propose as a group uh, with uh, and, and building on this tremendous amount of work and experiences that have been shared today uh, and it's been really super wonderful and we thank everybody. I would also like to thank a few people as well um, in, uh, in a few minutes. What we've decided to do, we will organise at a time to be confirmed but you will all be, all be contacted, um, a super interactive session where we can dig really into the conversation in terms of what needs to happen next. Um, so that's what we'll, we'll do. Uh, John will just launch a, a poll, um, the final poll, because this is fundamental also for what we wanted to talk about in the interactive discussion. We've also had a few panelists. One, for example, our clinician who looks after the elderly and had to leave for an emergency at his hospital. So, you know, we'd like to have next time perhaps a complete full house and we can really then open it up to everyone so john if you just like to launch poll three so this one is about if you're planning any form of collaboration or consolidation yeah so here you can see that uh, in fact many have not yet started collaborating so this is our opportunity to start uh, start that movement it's also important on our side to like take a step back and really analyze what's been going on and what needs to happen across all of these different associations. 
you know, had we been able to organise a face-to-face -face meeting, things would have been very different. Um, it's always a, an uphill struggle when you start doing these this kind of workshop um, virtually because, and we have you know, time constraints that work differently because we're all doing, well, most of us are doing smart working these days. Um, what we will do is we will um, create a web page, as I indicated in the chat, in the Q&A panel, where we will give you the link to the presentations. The recording will be available soon. If you need, for whatever internal reasons, for a raw uh, recording that cannot be shared, though, to, it has to be only for internal purposes, let me know and we can send a, a protected link to that. Um, just drop me a line and we'll do that. Um, so but I think also if we can manage to do this very short mini session, it could give all of us on the this workshop today time to kind of digest so much information and take stock of it all. And, and then we can really make sure that we have a panel discussion that then becomes a real truly open discussion with anyone and everyone who wants to stand up and speak. Um, you know, these things aren't easy, people are very busy and, you know, it's not an easy thing to always organise these things and to get, um, you know, we can't always, people have other work commitments, so, you know, even organising something like that is some, something like this, is something of a miracle, believe me. So a massive thank you to our panellists. On the screen you'll see a list of other people um, who need a big thank you and special wishes to one particular man that is Dr. Didier Burrs, who we wish a full and speedy recovery. He's not been with us for quite a few months now. We do, we would really love to see him back. But thank you to all of these people. Thank you to the chair of the pre sanitization Working Group always, also. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything, John, or we can open the floor to the panelists if we, they want to like, kind of make a final statement. I would actually have a, have a question to Fonshi, if, if um, you could help us out. Within our, our community, we had a, had a communication and discussion. Should, should, would we have a, a greater power if all of us individually and separately made, a, made an input to the, to the uh, RAN workshop and, and to, to essay workshop and uh, subsequent essay workshop? to show high numbers on, on, uh, on similar inputs or whether it be, we would, uh, would be better off in, in uh, being represented mainly by the market re representation partners trying to bring the voice of, of the community. How do you see this recognizing that there are already hundreds of inputs in the, in the workshop? Yeah, and that's a very interesting point. Um, and yes, something to think about. I do think though that a lot of the the, the webinars that we have done, and these are, the, the, the motivation does come from the market representation partners, but it's up to them individually to kind of drive something and to make it happen. Um, but we're, you know, very elastic. You know, we try to show in this particular event that we're very open to any vertical who wants to come and um, who wants to come on board standardization, what, work and who has done something already to showcase that because unless we also talk together it's very difficult and that one of the discussion points was how do we actually better coordinate and cooperate across the vertical industries more effectively because as a standards in the standards groups they do talk to each other you know people talk to their competitors but a lot of verticals don't. Of course, we have these fantastic associations that we're so lucky to have in this particular context. But it's not always easy. You know, how do we reach out to all of these companies that could benefit from 5G? And, you know, as Matthew was showing, the potential to expand is really actually fundamental. A lot, all of you have shown this. The potential is there. So I think this is something that we definitely need to take on board and we need to, like, see um, how we could fit this into the next um, separate session that I have proposed. 
Okay, can um, you hear me? Yes, we can, Hans. Okay, thank you. The question was whether uh, it makes a difference in whether uh, a lot of people send single contributions to um, RAN events or CDPP events or, or not. And uh, in my long experience, I would say that uh, what matters is when uh, you have a uh, uh, a lot of people saying the same thing, but they can do it in the same contribution by uh, co-signing the same document. You don't have to send 20 different documents to make the point that you all agree. So if you are actually uh, having a consolidated view, then it makes more a, a more uh, a higher and better impression in general if you are uh, uh, making that case with uh, 30 uh, companies and associations uh, saying uh, the same thing in one document than that every docu that every person and every company sends uh, a separate document where they highlight the same issues and come with more or less the same conclusions. In the end, people will just give up on, on checking all those documents because they're all saying the same thing. Yeah. So my recommendation is if you are, want to have a strong voice, uh, make uh, one or a few contributions which are uh, then supported by a lot of companies on the front page and a lot of organizations. Yeah, absolutely, Hans. In fact, this was one of the main drivers why, when we started to do this mapping of common requirements, um, which we haven't quite successfully completed this afternoon or this evening, I will admit this, but you know, we, we've been doing a lot. We've covered such a large number of verticals, I think. And if you think of the, the number of people that they represent individually, it, that scales out considerably but that is a really important point um because this is it you know as we've always been saying in our workshops and then in our webinars that one one a, a requirement that may seem so very specific to a particular vertical could be very very much valid for other verticals and that that they should be doing exactly what you've just been saying hence cosign and join forces Oh, it looks like Terry. Terry has something to say. Oh, Terry, off you yeah. go. I, I just wanted to conclude on what was said before on how um, verticals can can contribute. So it's very important to have effectively consolidate, let's say, way forward or, or, or proposal with many verticals involved or supporting, but as well also to have um, all the value chain from 3GPP uh, uh, supporting. Not only just the, the yes. vertical perspective, yes. but uh, yeah, the, the, the operator, the, the, uh, the network vendors, the device vendors. Um, that's, that's also key to move things forward. Yeah, that's, that's also a very valid point, Thierry. That's really important. I think what is encouraging, though, today is this, uh, we have been able to have this important touch base and to get uh, an understanding of where we are um, in the landscape. And I think this has also brought out just how rich we are from uh, in terms of run support and run interest and run active, you know, activities for verticals within RAN. And I'm not sure that this was totally fully appreciated up until now. Um, this for me is, is a positive takeaway. It's a, it's a force to change. Um, because we were, you know, the organisers themselves were getting a little bit concerned that we lacked the the, the run expertise. Um, we have good coverage on SA, for example, but we were feeling a little bit flaky on run. This workshop has proven the opposite. We're very rich and we're very strong, and this can only be a positive sign moving forward. Yeah. So thank you as well to everyone, and we have a good mixture of people that we've targeted um, TRE from, from the supply and the demand side. This can only grow bigger and bigger. And we hope, you know, this is always a kind of, we are in many ways, some of the early movers. We take the, the big steps when others are just taking the baby steps. Um, and it's having, the, but it's, it is having that courage to, to do this. And, you know, we don't live in a perfect world. So, no event or no discussion or no activity can ever be perfect. So 
you know, we, we, we're here to learn. We're, we're here to learn and to and to move forward with, 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 you know, with what needs to be done and when and how. Um, I think that uh, one more point to highlight is if you want to have influence in CGPP, uh, it was mentioned before in uh, one of the presentations, but you need some staying power. Um, one thing that doesn't work is if you have uh, come with a number of requirements and then expect that once you have delivered those, CGPP will go off and uh, handle your requirements yeah. and yeah. you will be yes. done. The, yeah. the successful verticals, as was also mentioned by 5GAA, for instance, are those that have been there for a longer period of time yeah. and have consistently brought in their uh, points in the discussion. Uh, also, at some point in time, you will need the uh, uh, some of the, the vendors and uh, uh, operators to support your uh, things going forward uh, in uh, uh, in implementation yeah. in protocols yeah. and things mm -hmm. like that. So the requirement stage is important at the beginning, but you need to stay longer in order to uh, get something through. It is not done within uh, one meeting or even a year of meetings or even mm -hmm. three years of meetings. Meetings. Absolutely, Hans. Yeah, this is this is one of our recurrent messages. Obviously, sometimes our audience has changed, so but this is a definitely something that we will continue to highlight. And what we've always tried to do, we've taken those those who've been there before, like 5GAA, for example, or 5GA CIA, and we take that as the kind of the leading points. But then we open the floor to, and we open the door to the other verticals, you know, and we've seen a, a lot of um, good examples. I mean, what Julian and Eric were presenting, you know, that was quite a journey that they had. And we look forward to having them on this mini interactive session so that they can dig down into that a little bit more. But yeah, it's the staying power, the staying power that is really important. So thank you, Hans. We'll get back into, we'll send everyone the page with the link um, to the presentations and then to the recording. Um, and then we'll, we'll think about how we can do this super interactive session sometime in the very near future. Yeah, because this is a, an important topic that we'd like to keep covering. We do want those um, viewpoints from, the in, from both sides of the, of, the, of the market. Okay, so thanks everybody. Special big thanks to our panelists. Special super thanks also to our participants, um, and we'll be in touch very soon. Jonathan, if you want to say a closing remark. No, thanks to everybody. We appreciate it very, very much. Yeah, and we, we look do, forward we to do seeing do you again soon. Yeah, okay.